Welcome to Caught in the Crossfire, the Adams County Historical Society's 2021 Battle of Gettysburg Anniversary Series. On July 1st, 1863, when the battle erupted north of town, Tilly Pierce was sent by her family to the stone farmhouse of Jacob Weikert along the Tawny Town Road. We're here at that farm today, thanks to the generosity of the current owners. We're going to paint a picture of what this was like through Tilly's eyes. Now keep in mind that Tilly's home on Baltimore Street would soon be behind Confederate lines, separating her from her loved ones for several days. She was just 15 years old at the time and witnessed some of the most traumatic scenes of her life. In her account, which was published in 1889, Tilly described the scene. Suddenly, she wrote, we beheld an explosion. It is that of a caisson. We see a man thrown high in the air and coming down in a wheat field close by. He's picked up and carried into the house. As they pass by, I see his eyes are blown out, and his whole person seems to be one black mass. I saw the soldiers carry him upstairs. They laid him on a bed and wrapped him in cotton. How I pitied that poor man. How terribly the scenes of war were being irresistibly portrayed before my vision. We're going to now walk around the property and visit some other sites that Tilly mentions in her account. We're now at the Weikert Farm Well. Here, Tilly described retrieving water for the soldiers passing by on their way to the battlefield. After the artillery had passed, infantry began coming. I soon saw that these men were very thirsty and would have to go to the spring, which was on the north side of the house. I was not long in learning what I could do. Obtaining a bucket of water, I hastened to the spring and there with others carried water to the moving column until the spring was empty. We then went to the pump, staying on the south side of the house. By evening on July 1st, Tilly began to see the first wounded soldiers arriving for medical treatment at the farm. She wrote, Now the wounded began to come in greater numbers, some limping, some with their heads and arms in bandages, some crawling, others carried on stretchers or brought in ambulances. Suffering, cast down, and dejected. It was a truly pitiable gathering. On the evening of July 1st, Tilly visited the inside of the Wickard barn for the first time. Before night, the barn was filled with shattered and dying heroes of this day's struggle. That evening, Becky Weikert, the daughter at home, and I went out to the barn to see what was transpiring there. Nothing before in my experience had ever paralleled the sight we then and there beheld. There were the groaning and crying, the struggling and dying, crowded side by side, while attendants sought to aid and relieve them as best as they could. We were so overcome by the sad and awful spectacle that we hastened back into the house, weeping bitterly. Inside the house on the night of July 2nd, Tilly witnessed some of the most harrowing scenes of the entire Civil War. The number of wounded brought to the place was indeed appalling, she wrote. They were laid in different parts of the home. The orchard and space around the building were covered with the shattered and dying, and the barn became more and more crowded. The scene has become terrible beyond description. That night in the house, I made myself useful in doing whatever I could to assist the surgeons and the nurses. One of these soldiers was evidently General Stephen Weed, who had been mortally wounded earlier in the day on Little Round Top. Tilly wrote, one soldier sitting near the doorway that led into a little room in the southeast corner of the basement beckoned me to him. He was holding a lighted candle in his hand and was watching over a wounded soldier who was lying upon the floor. He asked me if I would get him a piece of bread, saying he was very hungry. I said certainly, ran away, and soon returned. I gave him the bread, and he seemed very thankful. And then he asked if I would hold the light and stay with the wounded man until he came back. I said I would gladly do so, and that I wanted to do something for the poor soldiers, if only I knew what. I then took the candle and sat down beside the wounded man. I talked to him and asked if he was injured badly. He answered yes, pretty badly. I then asked him if he suffered much, to which he replied, yes, I do now, but I hope in the morning I will be better. I told him if there was anything I could do for him, I would be so glad to do it, if he would only tell me what. The poor man looked so earnestly into my face, saying, will you promise me to come back in the morning to see me? I replied, yes, indeed. And he seemed so satisfied and, and faintly smiled. The man who had been watching him now returned and thanked me for my kindness. I gave him the light and arose to leave. The poor wounded soldier's eyes followed me, and the, and the last words he said to me were, now don't forget your promise. I replied, no indeed, and expressing the hope that he would be better in the morning, bade him good night. The sun was high in the heavens when I awoke the next day. Keep in mind this is the morning of July 3rd, 1863. The first thought that came into my mind was my promise the night before. 
I hastened down to the little basement room, and as I entered, the soldier lay there, dead. His faithful attendant was still at his side. I kept my promise, but he was not there to greet me. I hope he greeted nearer and dearer faces than that of the unknown little girl on the battlefield of Gettysburg. As I stood there gazing in sadness at the prostrate form, the attendant looked up to me and said, do you know who this is? I replied, no, sir. He said, this is the body of General Weed, a New York man. Then on July 3rd, when the fighting reached its peak, Tilly left for safety farther south. She returned later in the day to find the house filled with wounded. She wrote, we hardly knew what to do or where to go. They, however, removed most of the wounded and thus after a while made room for the family. I remembered that Mrs. Weikert went through the house and after searching a while brought all the muslin and linen she could spare. This we tore into bandages and gave them to the surgeons to bind the poor soldier's wounds. By this time, amputating benches had been placed all about the house. I must have become inured to seeing the terrors of battle, else I could hardly have gazed upon the scenes now presented. I was looking out one of the windows facing the front yard, right where we're standing. Near the basement door and directly underneath the window stood one of these benches. I saw them lifting the poor men upon it, then the surgeons sawing and cutting off arms and legs, and then probing and picking bullets from the flesh. Some of the soldiers fairly begged to be taken next, so great was their suffering, and so anxious were they to obtain relief. I saw the surgeons hastily put a cattle horn over the mouths of the wounded ones after they were placed upon the bench. At first, I did not understand the meaning of this, but upon inquiry, soon learned that it was their mode of administering chloroform in order to produce unconsciousness. But the effect in some instances was not produced, for I saw the wounded throwing themselves wildly about and shrieking with pain while the operation was going on. To the south side of the house, right where we're standing and just outside of the yard, she wrote, I noticed a pile of limbs higher than the fence. It was a ghastly sight. Gazing upon these too often the trophies of the amputating bench, I could have no other feeling than that the whole scene was one of cruel butchery. Confirming the fact that General Stephen Weed was at this location is a letter written by Dr. Clinton Wagner in 1911. He was a surgeon in chief of the second division, fifth corps. On the porch of this house, Weikerts. The bodies of three gallon soldiers lay during the night of Thursday, all of whom were killed in a struggle on the summit of Little Round Top. They were General S.M. Weed, Colonel O'Rourke, 140th New York, and Lieutenant Hazlitt. General Weed was not killed instantly, as many accounts of the battle state. He was taken to the farmhouse and survived for about an hour or two, allowing him time to talk to Tilly Pierce as she describes in her account. 